<clears throat> well, now for the anticlimax. <clears throat> I think we titled uh, this evening Awakening Personal and Planetary, It's About Time. I think everybody <clears throat> has seen evidence of planetary awakening. Uh, we don't worry about what appears to be otherwise. That will take care of itself. Uh, but many uh, things are happening that indicate the planet is awakening. So let's talk about personal awakening. You know, everything. I, as soon as I get up here, I say, uh, say some words, and uh, words don't work. You know, it's all a paradox. Everything is a paradox. Uh, if you want to awaken the planet, awaken yourself. If you want to awaken yourself, awaken the planet. It doesn't matter what your goal is. It all leads to awakening. We're all, there's only one mind on the planet anyway. <clears throat> so if we're all connected, what's the difference? Awaken something, and everything else will uh, awaken. Um, Ashley Brilliant is a cartoonist. He does the pot shots in the newspaper. You see him in the Santa Fe News. I got this one uh, many years ago. Life is the only game in which the object of the game is to learn the rules. <laughs> so what are the rules that we uh, run our life by? <clears throat> Most of us probably think of ourselves as being light workers or being um, consciousness junkies or something on that order. Um, I guess the question is, um, is there a spiritual path? Do we, is there a spiritual path? Might we be on that path? Where does the path go? Is there anything we should be looking for? Should we do life in a random manner, the way it shows up, react to what is in our face at that moment? Or should we have a structure? Should we have a plan? Should we have um, a goal? Okay. Sometimes I say, uh, what if your goal was to make this life your last mandatory life? What if that was your goal? <clears throat> that brings up a few things, like, is what I have been doing leading me to the end of the incarnational cycles? Or is what I, I have been doing a repeat of what I did the last time I was here, and the time before, and the time before, and the time before? There's a Hindu proverb when the uh, student asks the guru, um, how many lifetimes does it take to become enlightened? And the guru said, imagine a dove with a silk scarf in his beak, and he flies back and forth over Wheeler Peak. I don't think the guru talked about Wheeler Peak, but he flies back and forth over Wheeler Peak and allows the scarf to drag across the top. And each pass is a lifetime. How long does it take for the mountain to be worn away? Maybe if that's what we're doing, we want to do something different. Um, <clears throat> lots of um, many years ago, actually this is the first time I have spoken in about 14 years, um, I used to speak around the country and uh, do workshops and kind of got the word that uh, I had a, a bit of ego uh, repair work to do on myself and it would be better if I was not a public figure to do that. So I was, uh, uh, my wife and I live up <clears throat> near Taos by Carson, in Carson by Taos, in the middle of the desert. Uh, we're out in the middle of nowhere. We make our own power with solar and wind energy. 
And uh, so I've been playing the hermit. We, we play the hermit uh, up there. That's our favorite role to play, has been for many years, is to be the hermit. Um, uh, and then got an inkling from spirit that it was OK to go back to uh, sharing information again. So uh, this is the first time we've been out for quite a while. <clears throat> but over the years, um, I have uh, I made a connection, my own connection with guidance. Um, I don't know exactly when. It seems like when my oldest daughter was born, which was 1968, uh, uh, that I became aware that there was something else going on and started uh, my first in, um, inclination was to learn what the master teachers knew. Whatever they know, I want to know. Um, then I discovered that um, we all have an intuitive sense. We all have an intuitive connection. Uh, there is actually no one who does not have an intuitive connection. The vast majority of people ignore that, don't believe in that, don't trust that, whatever. Uh, but everybody has that, so it can be brought to the surface. And in my uh, intuitive uh, connection, I developed, uh, I'm, I'm not a, a traditional spiritual guy, I guess. I'm an engineer, and so I like everything, you know, I like the universe to be mechanical. I, you know, I want to know you move this lever and that happens, uh, and that sort of thing in, in life anyway. So I have uh, guides uh, who are kind of like Bob. Uh, they uh, show me movies. They uh, do audiovisual displays for me. So um, I have, uh, over the years, um, looked at information that you know means nothing to anybody else. Uh, when we get guidance, when we get direction, when we get images, when we get thoughts, we get feelings, whatever we get, they're for us. You know, some people say, "Oh, this is you know fabulous. The whole world should." want to hear this, and they write it down in the book, and you know, nobody reads the book. But uh, it, it, it's, it's for us uh, when we get that sort of stuff. So my images mean nothing to anybody else, uh, but they've been fascinating to me. So I've gotten to see Earth from a distance, Earth from another perspective. Uh, or, uh, what do you think Earth is? What is you know, what's our opinion of, of this planet? What's our opinion of the reason for our being on this planet, our existence here? Uh, is there a reason, you know, or is it totally random, accidental, or whatever? Um, my vision is that Earth is a school, um, one that can be chosen from amongst millions of schools for souls, don't know about the words. Uh, individuations of God, not crazy about that word either. Uh, individuations of the universe, something like that, um, uh, who want to have experience, who set up their own experience, who create their own realities, who create their own paths. Nobody's following the path of somebody else. Um, and we have chosen voluntarily to enroll in this particular school. Okay? And by looking at it as a school, that's just helpful to me. Maybe that's not helpful to other people. But to me, that means uh, I would like to progress from one grade to another. You know, I would like to graduate someday. Uh, I think you don't have to talk very long to anybody on this planet before you discover they are familiar with things like pain, misery, suffering, bad relationships, lost jobs, bankruptcies, stock market crashes, and all the rest of it, right? So it's not an easy school. Actually, it's probably, well, from my, what I have seen, um, which is far from, you know, one millionth of one percent of what's out there, but from what I have seen, it's the toughest school there is. That people choose this particular school because they're in a hurry. 
because they want to expeditiously complete the curriculum. There are a lot of softer schools that you could have chosen to go to that would have taken millions of years longer to get where you want to go. So everybody's familiar with the fact that pain is a great motivator, that couch potatoes rarely seek spiritual enlightenment, that when we are backed in a corner, driven to our knees, battered severely about the head and shoulders, that's when we say help. That's when we look for an answer. You know, so some of the things I'm going to say might be a little, you know, something, you know, phrased differently than you've ever heard before, or whatever. But first thing I'm going to say is pain and suffering are not bad. Pain and suffering are what people have enrolled in because they want the fastest path to awakening that is possible. There are no victims on this planet. No one has been put into a position unfairly. Okay? And we've all been exposed to every possible painful scenario there is. You know, we've all seen children with leukemia and uh, bad relationships and everything that can come along. And to try to comprehend that that was a voluntary act on the part of the individual who was participating. Okay. Um, it takes a while <laughs> to, to grasp that. When you see somebody hurting, the first thing we want to do is fix them. You know, sometimes we just want to fix them because I'd feel better if you'd stop hurting. You know, it's not an altruistic thing. It's, hey, you're in pain around me and that makes me feel uncomfortable, right? So get fixed, would you? You know, something like that. Um, so what are the rules uh, for life on planet Earth? We create our own reality. We enrolled for a particular curriculum, and your curriculum is different than everybody else's. No two people doing the same curriculum. Nothing is unfair. Nothing is unjust. No victims out there. Well, so far so good. But how do we get out of the mess that we're in? What do we do to promote, to become aware of the bigger picture? We get so involved in the circumference of life that we never see the center. We get so involved in reacting to day-to-day -day situations that before we know it, that day's over, and I didn't even think about making progress in terms of graduating from the school. Well, I'll do that tomorrow. Next day comes along, right? So I should spend, what, 50% of my time doing whatever I believe it is I need to do to progress towards awakening. Maybe 80% of the time, maybe 100% of the time. Maybe I should go live in a monastery. Maybe I made a mistake when I enrolled in planet Earth to be the child of an alcoholic father, to live on the wrong side of the tracks, to not have benefits in my life. You know, There's a lot going on today that's almost got it, but not quite got it. I won't name any names, but the secret says, right, create whatever you want to create, right? Hold in mind that you want to be on the Oprah Winfrey show, and you can be on the Oprah Winfrey show, right? And she's had people there to prove that. Now, of course, she had one person when 80 million people were holding that in mind, and the rest of them didn't get it, you know. It is true that we do create our own reality. It's true that thoughts held in mind out picture. It's true that we need to remember that every moment of every day, that life is not in the least about reacting to the present moment situation that's in my face. For most people, that's 100% of what life is about. 
And for those who are on the verge of awakening, the bodhisattvas, those who wish to become Buddha-like, that is totally irrelevant. Every situation that you face that could turn out this way or that way, and I've got to have it turn out this way or I'll be devastated, is an irrelevant situation. I like the stories that Eckhart Tolle and Ram Das tell about the monk who learned to say, ah, so. Everything that came to him, he would say, ah, so. Right? The one that Ram Das tells is about the monk uh, who lives in the monastery, and one day a uh, man and a young girl show up at the door. And the uh, uh, monk answers the door, and the girl says, that's the man. That's the man who raped me. This is his baby. And so the man says, OK, you have to take the baby. You have to raise the baby. And the monk's response to that was, ah, so. Takes the baby, raises the baby for 10 years. A woman comes to the monastery, says, I came to get my child back. It's the baby of my boyfriend. But if I had told my father that, he would have killed my boyfriend. So the monk has to give up a child that he has raised for 10 years. And his response is, ah, so. Life is about ah, so. We don't stop to consider cause and effect. If life is a series of choices, this one will make me feel good. This one will make me devastated. If I go this way, I'll be devastated. I'll lose something. This way, I'll gain something. And we make a choice, always trying to gain something and avoid the devastation, that tomorrow there's another one. And the next day there's another choice. And the next day there's another choice. And the next day there's... We're so attached to the drama of life that we draw into our life drama. Our minds create our realities. So why is it that we have to have a million lifetimes simply to catch on to the fact that we create our realities and I could create peace and joy? How could that take a million lifetimes? Simply because we do everything the same way we did it the last time. Okay? Every, every choice, avoid devastation, go for what will make me feel good. Okay? So are there rules for life? You know, Life is the only game in which the objective is to figure out the rules. The rules are, as the Course in Miracles says, choose peace. Ah, so. Ah, so. Whatever shows up, ah, so. Now, that means you have to be willing to allow yourself to be devastated if that's what shows up. But we're so trained that we're bodies, not spirits, that we are bodies, and that the ultimate goal is to preserve the body. Don't be devastated. Don't lose money. You might be out on the street. Right? What if you were willing to accept any result of any decision with a simple, ah, so. Ah, so. Right? Or Eckhart Tolle says, be in the now. What's happening? To be in the now moment. All fear is of the future. All guilt is of the past. If you are in the now moment, you've been released of fear and guilt. That sounds pretty good, but we can't do that. We're hooked on fear and guilt. We're hooked on it, right? We are addicted to fear and guilt. We're addicted to the drama in our life. And you can prove this. It's very easy to prove. There are people who know you well, 
Ask them what drama you're going to have next week. And they can tell you because they know the drama you had last week and the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before. And they know you don't change your creation, that you're just stuck in repetition. All right? So what is personal awakening? Do we have to go to India? Do we have to find the right guru? Do we have to find the right teacher? Do we have to read the right book? It helps to have a support group. It really does. So we have a support group right here. New friends just made right here. May last a lifetime. Who knows? All right. Support group includes whatever spiritual textbook you read. Okay. But that has to be <clears throat> spiritual progress has to be your top priority. It can't be something that you put off because, sorry, I have to go buy groceries. It has to be more important than buying groceries. We can see why people don't do this, right? We have our priorities. We got our priorities from our upbringing. We know, you know, the gurus that raised us are the ones that we believe far more than any guru who became awakened or enlightened. And the gurus who raised us, who told us to stress ourselves to death, to work hard, right? Hey, doesn't that sound like fun? Let's do that for a million years. Work hard, <laughs> right? I don't know about that, you know. Uh, we're going to believe those gurus more than we would believe a Jesus or a Buddha or a Krishna, anybody else who had attained enlightenment. And the gurus who raised us all died of stress-related diseases. So what does that tell us about them, right? The ones who told us to work hard. One who, ones who told us to look out for old number one. Take care of yourself, right? Stand up to the situation. Hey, that sounds like fun, right? And meanwhile, there's other master teachers out there that are saying, be like the lilies of the field. Choose peace, right? Hmm. It's a little scary to decide that you want to become an awakened being. And I'm, I like, the Buddhists rarely speak of enlightenment because that implies to them all knowing. And from our perspective in three dimension time space, way down here in the lower left hand corner of the universe, right, there's no way we're going to have a perspective of infinite reality until we get there. So they use the word awakening. I like awakening. Awakening means I am now aware of how the system works, what this school is all about, how I chose to be here of my own free will. I determined my curriculum. I set up every relationship I've ever had. I set it up lifetimes ago. I set up every job I've ever had lifetimes ago. I've set up my next door neighbor and the grocery clerk and everybody else who's in my life. I have the ability to create infinite reality in the now moment. I do create infinite reality in the now moment. And that may sound, whoa, wait a minute, he's trying to pretend he's God or something. Well, being God is no big deal. There is nothing in the universe that is not God. You can't get out of being God. In the beginning, God. That's what it says in the beginning of Genesis. It doesn't say, in the beginning, God, plus the pile of bricks from which he made everything. It doesn't say that. God is the Big Bang. Everything followed the Big Bang in our experience. So you were a part of the Big Bang. So you're God, okay? Have to accept that, all right? So what is awakening on a personal level? Accept your divinity, and you can read the books, right? The Course in Miracles, I, I find it a fascinating set of, of books, a thousand pages, right? To say, choose peace. Why does it take a thousand pages? Because we're Westerners. We have to have the logic, 
We can't accept the truth without the logic, right? We can't accept happiness if there isn't a darn good reason for it, right? I'm not going to be happy just to be happy. I have to have some reason for being happy, okay? We like to blame everything outside of ourselves for our misery. What if there is nothing outside of ourselves? What are we going to do? Well, okay. We want to think in terms of awakening. We want to think in terms of awakening every moment of every day. And when a karmic situation arises, and that's one that has a win-lose choice to be made, that's always a karmic situation. That's one you played before. It's not new. You've played that not once, but 100,000 times you've made exactly the same choice. Right? It's getting old. I think everybody knows that's getting old. Okay, So we want to not learn how to be guilt-free, learn how to be fearless, learn how to be at peace, learn how to be joyful. If you wish to learn that, you can, but it's a slightly longer than infinite process. So it'll lead to another million lives or so. Okay? So we don't want to do that. All the awakened ones didn't give us a curriculum. They didn't give us a task list. Here's your to-do list. When you have completed that, come back and see me, and we'll see if we can promote you one grade or something. That doesn't exist. It's all making a choice, making a decision that I would like to be happy from here on. Everything that would make me unhappy, I'm going to look it in the face and say, ah, so, and go on. Not figure it out, not say, why did that show up in my life? Not say, how can I handle that? How can I process that? What went wrong? What did I do bad? You know, we've got all of this stuff going on. Hmm. Is it possible to simply say, ah, so, and move on? To be in the now moment, no fear, no guilt. That's future and past. Okay. Well, we're all aware that we live in three-dimensional time space. Okay? A small, tiny subset of reality. This is not reality. This is a motion picture, right? Played on the inside of your eyelids with quadraphonic sound. Right? That's all it is. Hmm. Time is involved. Could we bypass time? Could we simply step out of time and return to our natural state that we are created in of joy, bliss, unlimitedness, infinite wisdom? We could. But it appears to me that even though Buddha had an instantaneous awakening sitting under the Bodhi tree. It wasn't really instantaneous. How many years had he been sitting under the Bodhi tree to get to the point of instantaneous awakening, right? And how many lifetimes had he had working his way up in consciousness to where he could even contemplate sitting under the Bodhi tree for years? You and I wouldn't do it, right? He must have done some preparatory work to get up to that stage. So time's going to be involved. All right. That's all right. Gives us a lot of time to practice saying, ah, so. Right? We'll just say, ah, so. Another one of my favorite Hindu stories. The guru and the student were sitting in the hot spring. And the, guru, the student asked the guru, Master, what do I have to do to attain enlightenment? And the guru took his head and pushed it under water and held his head under water for two minutes. And when he let him up, <gasps> gasping for air, the guru said, when you want enlightenment as much as you wanted that breath of air, you will have it. We don't want it that much, right? 
Well, I would try to remember everything I know about awakening. I would try to make progress today by not repeating karmic events in my life. But I don't have time. First, I got to go to work, right? I got to fix dinner. Then I got to do this. Then I got to do that. You know, and maybe I'll have a fleeting thought before I fall asleep at night about God. Okay. Has to be what we want more than anything else that we could possibly imagine. We want awakening. That is our choice. Now, time is involved, so that means we get to watch our steps. We get to watch the progress. There's only one mind on the planet. I get these weird stories, and I don't know uh, how close, if at all, they are related to reality. But, you know, they're just stories I, I got. So, um, you know, it's, it's always not made sense to me that we're all one, right? I, I went through a phase of uh, talking about telephone wires. Right? I would say, well, we're all one, but you're different than me. So I can't comprehend that, so I'm going to pretend we're all connected instead of we're all one. So I use the term telepathic pool of energy. I say planet Earth is one telepathic pool of energy. We're all immersed in it. Any thought that one individual puts out into that pool can be accepted by every other individual in that pool. So Jesus and Buddha and other awakened beings put their thoughts into the telepathic pool of energy. They have to put their thoughts in the telepathic pool of energy if they're going to be considered saviors. That's the only way you can come from the outside and elevate group consciousness on planet Earth is by joining the telepathic pool of energy. And mind is all that counts here. Right? Bodies don't count. Bodies are dispensable. Bodies we can, disposable, we can throw them away and get more. We've done that thousands of times, right? Mind is what continues to exist. In this realm of reality, now don't think that mind is the ultimate reality because you are observing your thoughts. So who's the you that's observing mind? That must be above mind. That must encompass mind. Oh well, we can't, never mind. It gets a little mind boggling, right? <laughs> so we have to be willing, among other things, to say, I don't know anything. I don't know a thing. I don't know anything. And it may take lifetimes to accept the fact that you don't know anything, right? Because we were raised that our self-worth comes from how much we know, right? Our self-worth comes from the fact that we're educated, that we know how things happen. If somebody explains something to you and you think they're explaining, them, explaining it wrong, you'll tell them you know better, right? It's important to us to know more than the other people around us. Right? That's karmic. If you have to know more than other people, you're stuck on the wheel. Right? You're going to go round and round and around and around because we don't know anything at all. Right? We don't know how the acorn turns into the tree. Right? We don't know why we have to breathe to live. We don't know anything. No, we have no concept of what reality is. Right? We sit here and be battered about by the situations that face us every day. So obviously we're out of control. We don't have any control on what's going on. We don't know anything here. But we make progress. Right? We, we've all progressed. And the fact that you're interested in your spiritual growth indicates that you have done 99% of your lifetimes, that you have, you're, you're tired of repetitious pain and struggle. And so you want to move on. You want to go somewhere else, right? So you're, you're near the verge. You're near the edge of graduation, right? Okay, what about awakening planetarily? 
<clears throat> the movies that my audiovisual guy has shown me uh, indicate that time is not random, that time has meaning. Um, we like to read horoscopes, many of us like to read the horoscopes because we want to find out whether it's going to be a good day or a bad day, you know, those choices. Is this going to be for my benefit or is this going to be painful? I want to avoid the pain. I want something to make me feel good. Repetitious karmic choices, right? We want our horoscope to tell us it's going to be a good day. Don't have to deal with those bad choices and all that. But we don't understand what astrology is. We don't know the meaning of the ages or anything like that. The movies that I saw indicate that every age offers a particular energy which can be used to expedite growth in a certain area. And the Piscean age that we're just leaving is the age of the use of force, of people holding power over other people. Obviously, if we look around us, right, we see governments holding power over other governments and armies and militia and we see relationships. One person has to hold power over the other person. Every area we see the power struggle taking place. There are ages for each thing. There are 11 ages for expeditious growth. There is one age, the Aquarian age, in which people who wish to drop their karma can do that, in which people who wish to graduate can have huge support groups, can have an enormous amount of energy supporting them, and millions of other individuals who are on the same path doing the same thing. Okay, so it wouldn't matter, you know, if it were 10,000 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. If we were on the planet 10,000 years ago, uh, we were here to learn from karmic training, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and I'll kill you and you kill me and I'll kill you and you kill me and, you know, hopefully get to the point where we say, this isn't fun, let's stop playing this game, right? But now we have Aquarian energy. And Aquarian energy affects absolutely everything on the planet. Absolutely everything on the planet. There are signs in this building about community. There's one right there, how to build community, right? The community of pre-graduate students doesn't have to be built. It exists. It is. You know them when you meet them, right? They might be completely different than you, totally opposite from you in personality. But you can tell they're tired of this game. They want to awaken. They want to move on to a nicer environment. And the nicer environments are way beyond my comprehension. I was shown light that I simply could not look at. It's too bright for me, you know, too, too much bliss, joy, happiness for me to comprehend. But it's pretty nice. You will like graduating. It's, it's a very nice uh, situation. But the planet graduates with you. The planet graduates with you. So the planet is in a situation, in a, in a space, where we have Piscean energy, we have Aquarian energy. How do we, as spiritual students, who have no response to anything except ah so, interpret what we see? First of all, we interpret it as love. Karma is love. Paying karmic debts is love. Having a situation, having a school where people of their own volition can enroll to experience being blown away so that they will release their guilt on blowing other people away, that's love. That's progress. Okay? So we have to look on planet Earth from God's perspective, not from the human perspective.
The human perspective watches the news, and I hope you never again look at the news. But the human perspective watches the news and says, that's bad, that's wrong. Well, let's go fix it. Let's get them. What's your cause? My cause is stopping war. What's your cause? Your cause is, is making the earth green, ending pollution. Okay, everybody got a cause. Okay, let's go fight. We'll go fight for peace. <laughs> Talk about oxymorons, right? Fight for peace. You know, I try to say ah so, but I simply have not gotten to the point where I can say ah so when I walk in the grocery store and they're holding a pink can and say, will you join the fight against cancer? Love heals cancer. Fights create cancer. You know? It's a completely radical shift in the way that we think. We've got to look on everything from God's point of view. And from God's point of view, this is a very expedient school for getting individuals home in the fastest possible manner. And everybody who's here enrolled, not only enrolled, you had to pay tuition to get into this place. Right? And then you get here and you say, oh, I thought I was going to learn to be a master and I ended up in third grade remedial training. Right? Well, we're making progress. Millions of individuals will graduate from planet Earth within the next three or four hundred years. Tens of thousands of individuals will graduate from planet Earth within our lifetimes. And we want to be in the group. We want to be in the group. Okay. Does that mean I've got to change the focus of my life? I don't know. What's the focus of your life? Are you anti-something? Are you anti-war? Are you anti-certain politicians? Are you anti-certain economic structures? Are you anti-smoke? Hmm. You can be. That's all right. That just means you have a guilt trip from the last time you were here and you did all those things. You created all those things. That's where our causes come from. They're guilt trips. Our causes. I'm anti-war because I waged a war last time. I'm anti-pollution because I was the polluter last time. It's a perfectly fair system. right? Nothing happens to anybody that is random or accidental. Okay? So we need to reevaluate how we spend our time, what we do with our lives. Would you be willing to move into an ah so frame of mind every day simply to be able to make this your last life? Does that make any sense? Would you be willing to not resist evil? I believe the masters said that pretty clearly, resist not evil. They must have had a reason, right? They didn't say, resist not evil unless it comes from the Mideast or unless it's that person, right? Just said, resist not evil. Ah, so. Ah, so. Bad stuff happening. Ram Das, when he went to India the first time, was into all kinds of causes. And his guru said to him, can't you see how perfect it all is? And Ram Das said, no, it's not perfect. It stinks. And the guru said, could you accept the fact that it's perfect and it stinks? Maybe. It's all perfect. If God is love and God is all powerful, doesn't that mean there is nothing but love? I mean, if God is love and God is a wimp, yeah, then there can be other stuff, right? Individuations of that God can create stuff that's bad. But if God is omniscient, right? 
omnipotent, omnipresent, pure love. Nothing exists but love. Hmm. Okay, so our perspective is everything is okay just the way it is. Everything is okay just the way it is. You may have to repeat that a thousand times before you accept it, but that's the truth. Everything is okay just the way it is. Right? Hmm. Time is involved, so we take steps. We don't say ah so every time. We go back to the old technique. That's all right. That's not a problem. Right? Just say ah so the next time. Right? No guilt you have ever had was justified. Stop beating yourself up. No justification for any guilt you ever had. If any guilt you had was justified, that would be like saying your children in school have a right to feel guilty because they had to take a spelling test. You just take tests every day in your life. Are you going to choose to do it the old way or are you going to say also? Also. Time is involved, we get to see the steps. We see on our planet, in politics, in economics, wonderful things happening. Now, we can be judgmental and say, oh, it's great. Economics is leveling the playing field. The greedy have fallen, right? It's all going to be wonderful and equal. That's just a judgment. We have no idea what people need. We don't know their karmic histories. We don't need know what lessons they should receive. We can't fix anybody. All we can do is say, ah, so. We can say, we see governments becoming more humanitarian, caring more about people and less about greed. That's just a judgment. Government is whatever the masses need to make progress on their karmic path. And that's love. And we can say, I want this, not that. From God's perspective, both are love. Love is giving people the opportunity to make progress without violating their free will without taking them away from them the right to choose. People go to war until they get tired of going to war, and then they look for a better way. Okay. Everything that's happening on planet Earth is love. Tomorrow, you're going to face the same karmic choices you face today. That's the karmic groove, right? That's the cycle. You're going to face the same choices. If I choose here, I'm devastated. If I choose here, something good happens to me. Okay? There is no good. There is no devastation. There's just the natural state of being, which is divine. Right? Nothing is true except thinking makes it so. So from this point on, ah so. So tomorrow, would you be willing to see if you could say ah so 100 times? Neighbor's car ran over the cat. Ah, so. Somebody got an award. Ah, so. There's nothing but ah, so. Or be here now. Or the present moment. If you choose to be unhappy over any event that occurs, it's a little silly to ask, why am I unhappy? 
look at the choice you just made. Well, that made me unhappy. Okay, the universe will support you in your unhappiness if that's your choice. The universe will also support you in your bliss if that's your choice. Hmm. I see about 500 questions flying around out there. Let's uh, take a little break and ponder, seeing everything from God's perspective. And uh, when we come back, we can do questions and answers. We can do guided meditations and let you discover for yourself what your truth is, what your reality is. Go straight to the source. Don't ask somebody else to interpret the infinite for you. Make your own interpretation of the infinite. Look at your own life purpose. Whatever. I, we, there's just so much active intuition in this room that there's no telling where we can go if we start delving into you know, looking for our own answers.